Aloha. I know it's hot, but are you? Aloha. Aloha. Ah, that feels better. Welcome to church today. It is an exciting day as we wrap up our final part of getting stuck in life. And what do we do? Uh, a couple announcements real quick. Uh, in your bulletin is your take-home work. If you'd pull that out and put in your pocket or purse, uh, and that way you can go deeper this week. Also is a hot pink highlights sheet from what we did at council this past week. Uh, the church council is the governing body of our congregation. And so immediately after our meetings, we put together a bullet point list of what we did at council. If you have any questions, please feel free to talk to myself, uh, any of the staff, or any of the council members. Uh, and we'd love to answer them as truthfully as we can. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, I had a lot of people asking me, why do I have a robe on? Because uh, the last point was the council that gave us permission after last Sunday to not die uh, in the middle of the summer. It was the hottest service I have ever gone through in my life. Uh, and so it's gracious of them, but obviously we didn't take the robes off, some of us, <laughs> Bill. Uh, so uh, also the, today at two o'clock, if you are a singer and love to make a joyful noise to God, I invite you to come back and you're going to meet in the women's building right across the lawn. Uh, and prepare for the fall of the choir season. And so if you like singing, this is a great way to get plugged in and sing your heart's content and desire and, and just lift our spirits in worship, which is a gift for all of us. So would you pray with me as we begin our sermon together? Change our hearts, O oh God, and make them true. May we be a people that long for you in your presence and so may we be a people willing to look at ourselves honestly and allow you to shape and mold us. And so today, move among us. Shape and reform our hearts that they may beat like yours. And may we have eyes that see the world in the same capacity that you do. For the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. I can tell some of you got the video, the e-video that comes out on Fridays because you're sitting in the wrong seats. In this video, I talked about that every church that I've served, now four in totality, there's this phenomena that happens. You all sit in almost the exact same pew every Sunday. And so I can look out about halfway back and see your faces and know if you're here or not based on where you normally sit. But today, some of you are in the wrong place. I forgive you. Today we enter in this conversation after three weeks of looking at ways that we get stuck in life. The first way that we looked at is what happens when you get stuck in fear. And that fear overwhelms you to the point that you can't move forward. And we learn that the scriptural remedy to that is the angelic phrase, don't be afraid, I am with you. The second week we explored the issue of depression. And this real thing that many have suffered from or are dealing with today. And that the, the way that we begin the road to health and wholeness is a simple word saying help. Last week we looked at the issue of crossroads of life. When we hit these places we have to make big decisions. And how do we make it through the crossroads? And we saw, talked about how we pray and reflect and then prepare for the journey ahead. And today we come to the fourth way in which we get stuck, and that's the way of complacency. Complacency. Truth be told, this is my least of the four favorites of preaching on. It's not easy to talk about complacency because it's an invitation to get beat up by me and or to have to do something different than what we already do. And so what is complacency? If you think about it in your own head, what does it mean to be complacent? Well, according to Webster's dictionary, complacency is a feeling of being satisfied with how things are and not wanting to try to make them better. Being satisfied with the present moment with no desire to make anything better. 
Our faith of ours is 2,000 years old. In that 2,000 years, we've had moments of great growth and amazing story. Of times in which thousands of people joined the Christian movement. Lives have been transformed. Miracles done. But over that same course of time, there are countless moments where the church has been complacent. And sat around watching the suffering of the world. Saying, well, at least it's not my problem. And so what do we do as a Christian people? as a community of faith, but also as individuals, when we enter that place of complacency, that it's good enough now, and I'm not going to do anything to make it better. It's a challenge, isn't it? For many of us, we desire comfort, that we're comfortable in life. And what do we do when we're invited to step outside the zones of comfort in order to Join God on this great journey of bringing wholeness to the world. A book I began reading last summer was a book by the title of Leadership Without Easy Answers. And in it, the author positions this idea that we are people of equilibrium. We like it when things are steady or even or safe. In fact, how many of you have ever done that crazy idea where you take a pinata and you spin around a bunch of times and then you try to swing at the pinata and you can't see straight because your equilibrium's off? That when we get our equilibrium off, we don't like it. And so our goal is to get back to that equilibrium as fast as we can. And amazingly, over the many years of ministry, of the number of uh, most often women that are in abusive relationships, they know it's not healthy, it's not good, but it's normal. It's their equilibrium. And they may leave for a moment, but often they come back because that feels normal. How many of us do that in our own lives? That as soon as we feel like something's changing in our world, we immediately want to go back to what feels normal instead of living into maybe what God is now doing. Well, this author says this about the equilibrium And the issue that we have is people. For a social system or a person to learn, old patterns of relationships may be threatened. Old skills may be rendered useless. Beliefs, identity, and orienting values, images of justice, community, and responsibility may be called into question. Humans can learn and cultures can change. But how much and how fast? For systems under threat immediately try to restore equilibrium. Now I know I've been here for 15 months. And some will say I haven't done enough. And others will say I've done too much of creating change. And the continuum is huge on that spectrum. And what I would say to that is is that we have to be a people of change. Because the only constant that we know of is change. And so we want to converse with you and help bring our church into the 21st century so that we're a church a hundred years from now that's blessing the slippers off of the community still. But what we did that was so successful 10, 20 years ago was a different world in which we live today. And to try to recreate the past is impossible. We have to live into this moment. And it's hard. And so for some, they'll say we shouldn't change anything. We like the status quo, the status quo. And for others, they will say there are too many hurting people in this world that if we stop now, they suffer. And therefore, we must be a people of today and living into the future. Now, everyone in the church has an opinion and everyone has a vote, if you're a member. And we're going to walk through this phase of our life together, realizing that it's not going to be easy. We're going to have to ask the hard questions, and we're going to invite you to do it in your own life. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does that mean for us? Well, for me, what it means, it means that I am a person that follows the example of Jesus Christ. I Seek to embody Christ. And that is a high call that I'll spend the rest of my life trying to figure out how to do it well. 
but I hope I don't get stuck in complacency that it's good enough for now. Because there's enough people that I see week in and week out that struggle, that are hurting, and believe the church isn't the place for healing or for help. And so what do we do with that idea? Well, we turn to our sacred scriptures to be that which guides us through this phase of our lives. And today we turn to the book that no one understands, the book of Revelation. The thing that I love about the book of Revelation is you get the crazy ideas of the rapture that suddenly pilots are flying planes and they're not there. And people are driving cars and they're not there. And the preacher is preaching and hopefully he's not there. And this idea that God's going to use some kind of vacuum and suck up all the Christians out of the world and, and have some kind of tribulation for all those non-believers. For 2,000 years, this book of the Bible has been incredibly complicatedly interpreted. And how do we interpret a book that most people have never read before? And the ones that do say, what was John of Patmos smoking when he wrote that? Well, chapters 2 and 3 is where we're finding ourselves this week. And, and what is happening in chapters 2 and 3 is that there are seven visions to seven churches in Asia. And it's statements about what they're doing as a community. This was written about the mid-90s AD, 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And so in this time, they're living underneath a mass persecution. And they're also trying to figure out what does it mean for us to be Christian in a Roman-ruled world in which we're persecuted because of our faith. And so these messages are quite strong and quite interesting. Now, if a preacher was to stand up to their congregation and say, God says to you, you're neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm and I'm getting ready to vomit you out is the actual translation. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Guess what happens to that preacher? He starts looking for a new job. This is an incredibly strong message to a community of faith and to Christians in particular about their life with God. They've become complacent. And so there's all this imagery in these few uh, verses that are really important to unpack. Hot and cold. Let's start there. Up to six miles to the south from Laodicea, this community, is a community that is known for its hot springs. And these hot springs were used for medicinal purposes. It was believed in that community that if you went to the hot springs, you would be healed because of the power of the minerals inside of these springs. And so the hot springs is this place that has the imagery of healing. Ten miles the other direction from Laodicea is this community that is known for the freshness of their water. It's a natural spring of cold water in which as travelers came and went, they would stop at this place to drink deeply and to be refreshed. Do you see the difference between these two cities? One is a city marked by a healing place, and the other one's marked by a place of refreshment. And yet the city that's sitting in the middle along this trade route is the city that is lukewarm. It doesn't do either. And from the city six miles away, that hot spring water comes traveling down a river, and not too far from this city is where that water is seen. And that water, by the time it gets to Laodicea, is lukewarm. No one wants it. It's not good for anything. And this the city of Laodicea is also a quite interesting community. It was, uh, as a commentator said, a, a banking and finance and textile center, as well as a famous site for gladiatorial games. In AD 60, it was devastated by an earthquake, but the wealthy inhabitants refused Rome's support and rebuilt the city themselves. So I want to paint the picture of this community. It is rich. It is beyond rich. No other community in the ancient world rebuilt their own city without government help. In fact, they were so rich that it would be a place in modern world that only the wealthy inhabited. And so they were known for not only the banking industry, but the textiles. And what they had were black sheeps that created these black, beautiful garments. But they are also known for their medical school. And their medical school was believed to have been a place that they had created 
an eye ointment, an eye salve, that would bring healing to people losing sight. This community had everything they needed, they thought. They didn't have any natural water supply, and so they built a canal in order to bring water to the city. They believed that they, on their own, had everything they needed and didn't really have to do anything. And so as you open this scripture, it is this strong message to them in which the, the Spirit says this, My advice is that you buy gold from me that has been purified by fire so that you may be rich. The refiner's fire. And the difference contrasting is don't trust in the gold that you are earning, the banking industry. Trust in that which has no end, God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And white clothing... Opposite of what is their normal color that they produce? Black. White clothing to wear so that your nakedness won't be shamefully exposed. An ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. It's a jab, 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 jab kind of introduction to this church. And the statement that the Spirit is making to the church is you aren't being God's people. You're so stuck in complacency and saying, look at how great we are, when in fact you're the poorest of the poor of all these churches. You may have more money than anyone else, but you don't have heart. You don't have soul. You don't heal or restore. For a moment, as you think about your church, are we hot? Are we cold? Or are we lukewarm? The challenge for us is to look at this as a community of faith, but also as individuals. I joke around about how everyone sits in the same pews each Sunday. And honestly, it's a help because that way I know where you are. At one church, the last church, they switched sides, everybody in the sanctuary, on April Fool's Day. And one group sat on the right side that was normally on the left and vice versa. And I got up to preach and I was like, I can't preach. You all are in the wrong spots. Move back. But more than that is the idea that we just don't do much. The old adage in churches is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And it's true. I hear people say, I'm too old to do anything. That's false. Can you write notes to people? Can you pray for another? There are many ways to be involved in the faith community, and yet what I find so often are people that would rather just sit and throw grenades about what we're not doing. I believe the faith community isn't whole until all of us are participating. Participating in ministry, participating in the financial resources to fund the mission of God here, and participating in worship together. In God's kingdom, there are no passive participants. There are only active doers. How do we, as a community, look at ourselves and ask those deeper questions? What am I giving in order to bring healing and refreshment? What am I doing to bless others around me, whether here on our campus or out in the community at large? You see, the danger of complacency is that we get to that place where we think it's enough for me and we end up putting on blinders to the reality of the world around us. And it's scary to step out in faith into that unknown world and getting out of our own equilibriums in order to find a new one. But that's the journey of faith. We use the word maturity in spirituality, and maturity has nothing to do with your age. Did you hear that? You are not spiritually mature because you're older than others. You're spiritually mature because you take leaps of faith and follow God's call. And maturity is something that happens over years of practice. And we're called to be mature Christians that bless and change the world for God's kingdom. And we pray the Lord's Prayer 
May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We hear those words and say, oh, we got a job to do together. But at times it's too easy just to sit and be comfortable. A young man, many, many, many decades ago, was struggling with the notion of God and what does it mean to be a Christian in his time and age? He was frustrated with the church and the complacent way of being that the church exhibited. The injustice that was rampant and obvious, especially in the South. And he began to search for something more. And he came across an author, a minister in fact, who was in Hell's Kitchen, New York in the 40s. He began talking about the social gospel. That if we are people of gospel good news, it has social implications in our world. And that watching people die and suffer and saying, I'll pray for you, isn't enough. Instead, we have to come around the injustices and speak to them and change the world. Well, this young man ended up going to college and believed that the way that he could change the world was by teaching a new generation of young people that God's call to us isn't as much about where we go after we die as to how do we make heaven a little bit more on earth. The statement that he had read was, there's enough hell on earth to last eternity. Maybe we can invite a little heaven into that space. Well, this young guy ends up aging and gets a phone call as he is a professor at his, his college. And what he ends up finding is, is that this, this call is from one of the regents, one of the trustees of the college, and so he has to pay attention. And this trustee has a young son that's getting ready to come to his college. And so Richard Mays ends up inviting this young man to come and to learn and to listen. And he invites him to his house to have dinners and talk about the social implications of the good news of Jesus Christ. And how do we address the injustice that we see in our world. And for four years they met often. And he kept inspiring not only this one young man but others as well. Dr. Mays isn't well known in our world but his protege is. In fact, he did a eulogy at his funeral of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You see, Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to be a lawyer. He didn't want to be a minister like his daddy. But because of Dr. May's influence, Martin Luther King believed that uh, being a lawyer wasn't the right call. Instead, he needed to be a minister that created social change that invited people to see God's kingdom in its fullness. Dr. Mays could have sat and lived in the status quo. He had a cush job at the university. He could have sat and said, we're not going to ever be able to change anything, so I'm not going to do anything. But instead, he said, I'm going to change the world by inspiring a generation to go and change the world. And he never accepted complacency as a part of the Christian life. Because he said there are too many hurting people in our world to sit around and do nothing. Towards the end of his life, he was quoted as saying this, The tragedy of life is often not in our failure, but rather in our complacency. Not in our doing too much, but rather in our doing too little. Not in our living above our ability, but rather in our living below our capabilities. A strong message to the church in Laodicea. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm, and I'm fixing to vomit you out. It's a message that I need to hear often. We can get stuck in being status quo Christians that don't want to upset anyone. Or we can be a people of grace and truth and love and justice that brings wholeness to a broken world. 
I don't know about you, but let's get unstuck from complacency. And let's change our world, starting right here at Central Union. May it be so among us. Amen.